We are making our way through 1 Samuel. We've been in 1 Samuel for a few months, and we are in chapter 14 tonight. So 1 Samuel chapter 14. Uh, if you'd turn there with me, that would be great. 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're going to just jump right in and pick it up beginning in verse 1. It says, Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So we're inter- we were introduced to Jonathan last week, right? Um, we learned, as verse 1 here tells us, that this was Saul's son. This was actually Saul's oldest son. And so far, and we're going to really see this tonight, um, he is the total opposite of his father. We saw last week that Saul really was a man who was weak in the faith. He was a man that demonstrated he walked by sight. When Saul saw his army running away and hiding in the rocks and the holes, he panicked. And rather than waiting on the Lord to deliver him, Well, he rushed ahead of the Lord. He was told to wait seven days until the prophet Samuel arrived, and Samuel would offer up burnt offerings unto the Lord before they went in battle. But as Saul looked out at the size of the Philistine army, and he saw his own soldiers deserting him, and the seventh day came and Samuel hadn't shown up right away, Saul panicked, and he took matters into his own hands. He assumed the role of a priest, and he offered up burnt offerings to the Lord, and this was a big no-no. This was a big no-no. Not only was it forbidden for a king to do this, but it was a deliberate action of disobedience to what he had been commanded. And because of Saul's foolish, impulsive decision... The Lord took his kingdom from him. The Lord had already eyed out King David. He was just a boy at this time. He wasn't ready to assume the throne yet. So Saul's going to continue to reign for a little bit, but the decision's been made. His kingdom's been taken. Now, Saul's son, on the other hand, was not only a man of great faith, but he was a man of action. While Saul fumbled around in doubt and disobedience, Jonathan was putting in work for the Lord. Well, here we are again. This time it's Jonathan and we're told his armor bearer. That would be a servant whose job it is to assist in carrying the warrior's weapons and shield and spear and things like that. And we see that Jonathan tells his armor bearer, hey, armor bearer, Let's go into the Philistine garrison. Why? Well, to attack them. Now, think about that. The Philistine army was far superior to the Israelite army in many ways. For one, they outnumbered the children of Israel big time. The Bible says they had soldiers as the sand of the seashore, they had superior weapons. They were advanced in iron and weapon making. The only people in the army in Israel that had weapons were Saul and Jonathan, at least sword and spear. They had chariots, 30,000 of them. Those were battle tanks back then. And here's Jonathan and his armor bearer, just the two of them. And Jonathan says, let's go to that Philistine garrison. Now, Someone like that is either completely insane or they have complete, total faith in God. But Jonathan knew that what was happening wasn't right. Israel was God's special people, okay? They had a covenant with God. They had the promises of God. And they were being bullied by these uncircumcised pagans. 
And Jonathan wasn't the type of guy to sit around and watch God's people be bullied by the enemy. But as for Saul, the earthly king, the desire of all Israel, the man who was the best looking and the most tall out of them all, well, verse 2 says, and Saul was sitting. What what was Saul doing? (laughs) Saul the king was sitting. Like I said, complete opposite. Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. So he started out with 2,000, Jonathan had 1,000, and eventually they dwindled down to 600. Verse 3, Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sena. The front of one faced northward, opposite Michmash, and the other southward, opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. And so his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. So you see, as the king is sitting... (laughs) With his 600 men hiding, his son Jonathan is ready to go to work. Ready and willing to be used by the Lord. And to me, verses 6 and verse 7 are the most powerful verses in this chapter. And they reveal to us the heart and the faith of the man that truly trusts in the Lord. They reveal to us the kind of man God uses. So, hey, armor bearer, you know those Philistines with the 30,000 chariots and, and the men like the sand of the sea? Yeah, Jonathan, let us go over to their garrison. Let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, these pagans. And as I read that, I couldn't help but think of King David. When the whole Israelite army was terrified to fight the Philistine champion, Goliath, this young shepherd boy showed up to give his brothers on the front line some food. He had heard this giant Philistine blaspheming God, challenging God's people. And this is what David said. It's in 1 Samuel 17, 26. David said, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And takes the reproach away from Israel. And and then this is what David said. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Wow. You see, both David and Jonathan knew who their God was. They knew what their God could do. They knew God was with them. It's no wonder that Jonathan and David become good friends later. But I I love his armor bearer's response. Verse 7 says, So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. Now, that is quite a difference between Saul and his 600 men sitting, hiding, and trembling. But look with me again at what Jonathan tells him in the second half of verse 6. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Who needed saving? Well, Israel did. 
Well, when Saul seen he only had 600 men, he didn't know how Israel was going to be saved. He was scrambling. He was acting on impulse, rushing ahead of the Lord. You could even say that Saul was trying to do this in his own power and might. But look at Jonathan here. Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. They were the few. It was just two of them. But Jonathan knew with his whole heart that God isn't restrained by numbers. If God's will is to save, he can use one man. We see that in the book of Judges. For example, we look back to a man named Shamgar. Killed 600 Philistines with a stick. Or how about Jesus using just 12 men to turn the world upside down? How many people have been saved by just the faithful few disciples sharing the gospel throughout the world? Or how about the Apostle Paul? One man, one man who wrote most of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit And how many people have been led to Christ and saved because of the words Paul wrote? God isn't restrained by anything, especially numbers. Jonathan knew that. He believed that with his whole heart, and he encourages his armor bearer with that truth. But also notice that Jonathan is careful not to presume upon the Lord giving them the victory. I mean, surely Jonathan wanted nothing more than to defeat these pagan Philistines. But he didn't just assume that this was the Lord's will because this was his own personal will. And that can happen sometimes. Where we get so hung up on something, we convince ourselves we're right about something. We become so passionate about something and tunnel visioned that we begin to convince ourselves this is what God wants us to do. This is God's will for me. Some very bad situations have happened because of that kind of thought. But Jonathan had wisdom and he understood the Lord's will may very well be different from his own. Notice he says, it may be. It may be that the Lord will work for us. In other words, numbers don't restrain God. He can save with few or many, but God may have a different plan, Jonathan, our armor bearer. Or perhaps God will work for us. Perhaps this is his will. Before we just rush in assuming this is what God wants, let's make sure. Let's make sure. And what a wise thing to do. And so Jonathan creates a sort of test to find out the Lord's will in this situation. After his armor bearer agrees to go with him, verse 8 says, Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men. And we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has delivered them into our hand and this will be a sign to us. And so both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Ha, ha, ha. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, all right, come up after me for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. And they, the Philistines, fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. 
And so did you see his plan? Did you catch his plan there? He says, let's go over to the garrison. We're going to pop up and we're going to wave at them. (laughs) And if they say they're coming down to fight us, well, then we know that God has a different plan. But if they call us up to fight them, then we will know the Lord has given us this victory. We will know the Lord's will in this situation. That's the test. And so they climb up, and they wave at the Philistine enemy. And the Philistines, they respond really by cracking a joke. Oh, look at the Hebrews. They've come out of the holes they've been hiding in. Obviously, this was referring to Saul's men running and hiding. Remember last week we saw they were hidden, hiding in bushes and rocks and caves and anything they could hide in. Well, so they're cracking a joke about that. But their next words would seal their fate. Come up to us and we'll show you something. Or come on up here and we're going to teach you a lesson. We're going to teach you something. Well, that was a sign Jonathan was looking for. Now, he knew the Lord would deliver the Philistine garrison to them. He knew that the Lord would, in fact, use few to save. And so Jonathan climbs up. He starts taking them out. And his armor bearer climbs up right behind him, and he's finishing them off. Twenty Philistines killed by two men full of faith in the Lord, who depended on the Lord for their victory. Well, verse 15 says, and there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. So, in other words, God sent a great earthquake. This would have sent the Philistine army into a full-blown panic. Remember what happened last time they upset the Lord, the God of Israel? Okay? (laughs) They were plagued with tumors, right? You guys remember that? (laughs) Had to make images of those tumors and everything else. Rats. And so here these two Israelites attack them, and then this massive earthquake hits, right? Verse 16, Now the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, And there was the multitude melting away, and they went here, and they went there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For at that time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now, it happened, while Saul talked to the priest, that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. And so Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was a very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in battle. And so the Lord saved Israel that day. And the battle shifted to Beth Haven. So there's Saul, right? Saul and his men, they're sitting in Gibeah, kicking back. This was about a mile and a half from where Jonathan and his armor bearers were putting the smack down at this Philistine garrison. And the watchmen noticed the commotion in the Philistine camp, Saul's watchmen. They're looking out over there and they see something's going on. The Bible tells us it looked like the enemy multitude was melting away, right? Obviously, someone is attacking the Philistines. They're panicking. They're running. And so Saul orders a roll call to be taken, okay? And so, so so-and-so here, so-and-so here, 
Jonathan, mm. Jonathan's armor bearer, mm. they're not there. They were missing. And so Saul calls the high priest. And the text says he called for the ark, but that's really not the best translation of what that's saying. Um, the Septuagint says call, Saul called for the ephod, okay? And that makes sense because the ephod was the garment worn by the high priest. And if you remember, the Philistines sent the ark back because of the tumors and everything else that was going on. And it came to that Levitical city and the men the Israelites looked into the ark and God struck a bunch of them down. And what they do? They said, get that ark out of here. And they sent it far away to a father and son who took care of it. Now all of a sudden it's on the scene. So that's probably not the best translation here. Now in the priest's, the high priest's garment, okay, were hidden something called the umen and the thermen, all right? And these were basically two different colored rocks, possibly one white, one black. And the priest would use these rocks to discern the will of the Lord. Okay? It's kind of like casting lots. And that's what Saul was trying to figure out. Should he and his trembling 600 rush into battle while the enemy is panicked and scared? But notice how out of sync out of tune, Saul is with God. God had already decided to give Israel the victory that day. Jonathan and his armor bearer were laying hold of that. And here's Saul fumbling around. He has a form of godliness. He wants to seek the Lord's decision, but his actions show he isn't a godly man. And so the priest begins seeking the Lord's will. And we're told the cry and the panicked screams from the enemy camp, well, they got louder, and they kept getting louder and louder. It was getting worse over there for the Philistines. And apparently God was taking too long for Saul. Because look at the last three words in verse 19. He tells the priest, withdraw your hand. Withdraw your hand. In other words, I'm not waiting any longer on God's decision. I'm making the decision myself to join the battle. Withdraw your hand. This is the second time we've seen Saul rush ahead of the Lord. Again, walking by sight and not by faith. And so Saul grabs his 600. They rush into battle. The enemy is so confused that God causes them to begin attacking each other. Now it appears that some of Saul's soldiers who had deserted Saul in the, the first battle had either defected to the Philistine army or perhaps these were Hebrew prisoners of war forced to fight for the Philistine army. Either way, we're told when they saw that the children of Israel were, were whooping the Philistines, they came out of their hiding places and they, and they withdrew from the Philistine ranks and joined forces back uh, with the Hebrews. And verse 23 says, So the Lord saved Israel that day. And the battle shifted to beth -Avon. Take a look now at verse 24. We see that, that downward spiral of Saul here. It says, And the men of Israel were distressed that day. For Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. And so none of the people tasted food. Now all the people of the land came to a forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan, well, Jonathan had not heard his father's charge, charge the people with the oath. Therefore, he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand, and he dipped it in a honeycomb 
and put his hand to his mouth, and his countenance brightened. Then one of the people said, Whoa, Jonathan, your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. But Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For now, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? And so we see here Saul's foolish oath. The men had been fighting all day long. Fighting for their lives in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were completely wiped out. Completely exhausted. And Saul commands that none of his hungry soldiers eat a morsel of anything until what? Until he gets his revenge on his enemies. And so we see another comparison here. What did Jonathan do with his one man? Well, he encouraged him in the Lord. Armor bearer, God can do this. Armor bearer, God can use just two people like us to save Israel. God isn't restrained. And that armor bearer was edified and he was strengthened in his faith and he was encouraged. And he said, all right, let's do this. But how is Saul treating his men? They're weak. They're tired. Is he strengthening them? No. Is he encouraging them? No. He's threatening them. You're all going to suffer until I get what I want. It's all about me. It's all about my ego and my pride. If any of you eat anything, you're cursed. And it's sad because again we notice how out of tune Saul is with God. Because here is God and He's using that army. He's doing this awesome thing, this awesome work here. He's allowing the children of Israel to defeat their enemies. But here's Saul really hindering what God is doing. He's starving the already weakened men that the Lord is trying to use. He might as well join the Philistines. And he's doing it for his own selfish reasons, mainly for his own pride. That's something we're going to see with Saul as we continue through 1 Samuel. He had a real pride issue. Had he been a real man of God, he would have remembered Deuteronomy 32.35. In regards to Israel's enemies, the Lord says, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. Even the New Testament tells us in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But as for Saul, well, he was bent on revenge, even at the cost of his own soldier's welfare. What a foolish thing to do when you see God using people for His glory to do things that cause those people to be weaker. Well, as the people are walking through the forest, they come across this wild honey, big fat honeycomb just sitting there. And the text says it was even dripping. Like, it's really describing this to us. And don't make fun of me. My wife calls me Pooh Bear. It's not because I look like Pooh Bear. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking that's messed up. <laughs> it's because I love honey. I love honey. I mean, my mouth was literally watering as I was reading about the honeycomb thing. I thought, man, I wish I could stick a stick in a honeycomb and try it. 
Like, I understood why Samson did that, you know, why he, he went and reached in that lion's carcass, you know. But the men were terrified. They were terrified to eat any of it because of Saul's foolish threats. Well, here comes Jonathan. He wasn't there when Saul said this. And so he sees the honey and he does what I would have done. He dips his spear in it and he eats some of it. And we see at the end of verse 27 that his countenance brightened. Remember, honey is pure sugar. It's a carbohydrate. And so immediately boosted his energy. And it tasted good. I had a bunch of dirt in his mouth, you know, fighting all day. And so his countenance brightened. Well, the soldiers yelled out, Oh man, you messed up, Jonathan. Your dad said if anyone eats before he gets revenge, they're cursed. And look at the wisdom of this young man, Jonathan. He really should have been king. But after all, the Lord's teaching Israel a lesson that no earthly king can ever do for them what he can. But Jonathan says, my father, Saul, has troubled the land. And that's definitely an understatement, isn't it? And then he makes a good point. If my father would have allowed the men to eat the food of their defeated enemies, we would have really whooped them. How much greater of a slaughter if the men were energized, you know, full of food. And the last verse tonight, verse 31, goes on to say, Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. And so the people were very faint, distressed and faint. I was really hoping when I started putting this together that we would get further tonight, but time isn't going to permit it, guys. So let me just wrap it up and close with this. There are many things for us to glean from in this chapter. When we continue next week, we're going to glean even more. But what really stood out to me so far was the stark contrast between King Saul and his son. But let me put it this way. The difference between a man that God will use and a man that he won't. When Jonathan was willing to step up and do something for the Lord's people, Saul was sitting. He was content, just sitting there doing nothing. When Jonathan was willing to do something, he knew that it was the Lord who would do it through him. He believed and he had faith that nothing could stop the Lord from saving his people if he wanted to. Numbers didn't matter. Saul, on the other hand, was all about numbers. Seeing his 2,000-man army dwindle to 600 men threw him into a state of panic and rash decisions, leading to disobedience and eventually the loss of his kingdom. Saul totally showed a lack of faith in God and instead put faith in his own ability and in the numbers of his army. When Jonathan was ready to do something, it was a pretty big thing he thought about doing. The best Saul could come up with was, let's sit here under a pomegranate tree. And he was okay with that. But Jonathan knew how big his God was. And so he thought big. He had a big vision us too can be used by the Lord to wipe out every one of these uncircumcised Philistines if the Lord wants. When Jonathan was ready to do something, he didn't presume that this was God's will. He approached it cautiously, and he really sought the Lord to see if his hand was upon this thing that he was going to do. He told his armor bearer, it may be that the Lord will work for us. As where Saul simply didn't feel like waiting to get an answer from the Lord anymore. Withdraw your hand, priest. Withdraw your hand from inquiring of the Lord. And he made a decision just to run into battle on his own authority rather than God's. Why? Because the enemy was weakened? The enemy was in chaos? The Bible says at the very end, guys, when the armies of the nations come against Jesus, 
that with one word out of his mouth, he's going to wipe every one of them out. Vaporize them. How foolish to be one of God's children and think your only chance of victory is to take advantage of a weakened opponent. Again, a lack of faith in God. When Jonathan and his one soldier were ready to do something, Jonathan encouraged his armor bearer, edifying him, building his faith in the Lord. God's got this, dude. We're going to be okay. But Saul, well, his men trembled in fear. He starved them after they fought hard all day, and he threatened them with a curse if they ate anything. And so you see just some major opposites between this young godly man being used by the Lord and this old worldly man who's not being used by the Lord. And that's important because we as Christians, we can either be Jonathans or we can be Saul's. We can be Jonathans or we can be Saul's. We can be content just sitting and doing nothing or we can be willing to do something not because of who we are but because of who God is the Bible says in 2nd Chronicles 16 9 for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who heart, whose heart is loyal to him See, the Lord's always looking for someone to use. Someone he can show himself strong on behalf of. And what's he looking for? What's the one thing he's looking for in that person? A heart that's loyal to him. Jonathan had a heart loyal to God, and the Lord did use him. And the Lord did show himself strong on Jonathan's behalf. He used two men to wipe out an entire Philistine garrison. And then he just topped it off with an earthquake. Something I'd like to encourage us all in is to have that same mindset that Jonathan did. It may be that the Lord will work for us today. Every morning we should say that. And we should believe it. It may be that the Lord will work for us today. But we must be willing to do something, not sit under a pomegranate tree. When you have the mindset that God might work for you today, and you have the faith that God can do anything, and you have the willingness to step out and see what Jesus might want to do, then you might be one of the few that the Lord uses to save. God's eyes go to and fro on this earth looking for men and women with the heart of Jonathan, guys, whose hearts are loyal, and he will do amazing things through us and show himself strong on our behalf. It may be the Lord's will to work for us today or tomorrow or the next day. Question is, are we willing to step out in faith and see how? Let's pray. And so, Lord, we come before.